next session we have is going to be looking at the many different attempts that have been to silence whistleblowers. We know that it's often easier to shoot the messenger rather than heed the messenger, or heed the message rather, but we've now got a term to describe how legal methods can also be used to prevent speaking up. SLAPs, as they're known, are strategic litigation against public participation. So we're going to be having a look at what effect are these having on whistleblowers and what tools can we use to stop slaps being used against journalists and whistleblowers. Our panel now is going to be chaired by a very long-standing Protect Council member, my friend and academic of high standing, Yvonne Cripp. So over to you, Yvonne, with your panel. thought I was going to be in splendid isolation for a moment there. <laughs> it's uh, lovely to see so many people who go all the way back to the uh, founding of Protect and some even before, people like Marie Stewart. And I remember going to interview Guy Dame in 1980 when he was at the National Consumer Council and I was working on a book on whistleblowing. And he was just enormously helpful to me with the same sparkling energy that we still see and saw this morning. So we're dealing, as you can see, with slaps. Uh, and it must be said that freedom of expression is the bedrock of our society. Uh, without it, People cannot speak out, others cannot be held accountable. We can't hold people to account if we can't criticize them. Uh, slaps are obviously extremely effective at silencing dissenters, journalists, activists, and whistleblowers. The simple threat of litigation may be enough to silence or halt public spirited disclosures. We heard this morning from Paul Caruana Galizia, whose mother was murdered uh, on account of her public spirited disclosures. And she said, slaps are laws that were designed to protect people who are genuinely hurt, now being used as a tool of abuse by people in power against people with no power. So what typically are the slaps used to silence whistleblowers? How can they be countered? Uh, how do we rebalance the power relationship between the lone voice for the public interest and the might of a well-resourced organization? Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our wonderful panel to explore these questions. Uh, first, Jonathan Taylor, who is a lawyer in the oil and gas industry, courageously blew the whistle on massive corruption in that arena. He will tell us what his former employer, SBM Offshore, did to punish and silence him and of the extreme consequences of their actions. Jonathan reported to six international prosecutors, leading to over $840 million in fines, uh, and to the conviction for fraud of not just one, but two former CEOs of the company. Then we have Gavin Miller, King's Counsel, one of the best known names in media law. He advised The Guardian on its Edward Snowden stories, and he is acting for Carol Cadwallader uh, in the libel proceedings brought against her by Aaron Banks. Gavin is also acting for Josie Stewart in her case against the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office regarding her disclosures to the BBC about the failures of the Afghan Crisis Centre. 
Uh, next, um, Marion Jones will give us the journalist's perspective on SLAPS. Uh, Marion spent many years running investigations at Newsnight and Panorama. He won the Daniel Pearl Award for his investigation into the dumping of Trafigura's toxic waste in Africa and also the London Press Awards Scoop of the Year for his part in the Jimmy Savile revelations. Then we will hear from Charlie Holt. Charlie is legal counsel for campaigns at Greenpeace, as well as UK campaigns manager at English Pen, one of the oldest human rights organisations supporting the freedom to write and the freedom to read internationally. He co-chairs the UK Anti-SLAP Coalition and will tell us about latest developments in Europe and the UK. So, Jonathan, please tell us your story. What did your ex-employer do to silent, punish and attempt to silence you? Thank you. It's great to be here, by the way, and um, thank you so much to protect. Um, so twofold. There was the tip of the iceberg and the, the rest of the iceberg. The first was a typical slap, a defamation case um, for publicly stating that the company paid $250 million worth in bribes over five years, um, that they tried to cover it up, and that they tried to conceal and mislead um, the public, the markets, um, about the extent of their corruption. They sought €600,000 against me, so the case was taken in Rotterdam, um, in material and immaterial damages. They wanted a public apology to be published in a number of newspapers in the Netherlands and in the UK. Um, should I not do that, I'd have a €25,000 fine and then for every day thereafter another 10000 And if I ever dared to feign again, again 25000 and then another 10000 until the breach stopped. I'm not quite sure how I unbreached it, but anyway. Ultimately, it had the desired effect in that um, I was the, chill, the chilling effect was with me. How on earth am I going to defend this? How am I going to afford to defend this? Where do I turn? to a different country. And, yeah, probably lost sleep for about three weeks, grew uh, at least a year, and was frightened, absolutely petrified, which is precisely where they wanted me. Um, thank goodness um, I found a Dutch lawyer, Otto Volgenhout, of Books um, Law Chambers, or Advocates, and he managed to represent me um, at a far reduced price. Before the writ was even served on me, so this was in June 2015, they managed to get a freezing order over my property and sought also to get a freezing order over my bank account. Imagine trying to pay a lawyer when you can't even have access to your bank account. Fortunately, they didn't get the, the, the latter, but they got the former. Um, ultimately, unfortunately for them, those three statements were all true. A defence was filed with 148 exhibits. And then this is a quirk of the Dutch legal system. They were able to apply for a nilhil um, order, which meant that they reduced their claim against me to zero. And that automatically led to the uh, case being dismissed by the judge. So I never even got my day in court. But as terrorising as it all was, little unfortunately did I know that was to be the tip of the iceberg. Way earlier, back in September 2014, um, where I worked, their headquarters, even though it was a Dutch-listed um, blue-chip company, was in Monaco. They filed a complaint in Monaco for attempted extortion, a frivolous and vexatious complaint, all the same, that's what they did. Monaco was very much in cohorts with SBN. SBN was their, um, their darling. They wanted more blue-chip companies setting up in Monaco. They would issue stamps celebrating their products. Um, the prints would go on, on trade trips with them. They even opened um, their... their uh, Creche, and when in the, in the midst of all these fines being reported, he proudly opened their new office facilities in the Principality. Ultimately, I wasn't told for three years till 2017 about those proceedings from the, the, the prosecutor's office. Um, I refused to go anywhere near Monaco because of all the, the, the six prosecutors that had pursued um, SBM to get all those fines, um, Monaco was not part of it. They, they didn't pursue anyone, even though most of the bribes this is what we're talking about, um, were, execute, were, were, were formed and executed um, in, in the Principality. Um, 
the matter went to trial after I had been charged in my absence. Um, it was uh, thrown away, dismissed on the basis of uh, repeated uh, breaches of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights about time, timeliness and communicating in, uh, communicating in a language I, um, I didn't understand, or it should be as obviously in English I could understand. So I really thought very little of it. In the meantime, I was able to continue with my career as a contractor. Everything was basically fine. Well, that's rude interruption with the, uh, the defamation proceedings. Fast forward to 30th of July 2020, arrival on a family holiday. So this is just after first lockdown in Croatia, in Dubrovnik. Um, I was arrested under an Interpol red notice for bribery and corruption, which I think was the nearest they could tick the box to um, this... this um, accusation of, of attempted extortion. So I was arrested now in front of my family. Um, after I got out of jail, um, I ultimately was stuck in Croatia for 50 weeks. The case kept going from the, um, the, the, the county court to the Supreme Court. And the sixth time of asking, the Supreme Court decided I should be extradited. That decision had to then go to the Minister of Justice. He had to rubber stamp it and he um, ultimately determined that I shouldn't be extradited and I was set free. But the damage um, was now done. Uh, my 26-year marriage was now over. My career was in absolute shreds. Everything important to me had gone. Um, continuity, solidity, predictableness in your life had, had all gone. And uh, the damage, ultimately, you could say SBM won. The, the punishment was getting that red notice, which should never have occurred. I hadn't even been charged. Um, and, and, but but they, they did what they did, and to a large degree, I would suggest um, that they, they won. This was more in retribution. Most of the damage I'd caused had already occurred, not all. Um, but uh, that was ultimately how they, A, tried to, to silence me, and B, well, ultimately tried to destroy me um, by act of revenge uh, for, for what I did. Um, and of course, yeah, my life is now chaotic and haywire compared to the, the life I had before I got onto that plane on the 30th of July, 2020. What I'd like to do just before I finish this segment, however, was when I was in Croatia, um, a support group was set up um, literally in less than 12 hours of my arrest. They were absolutely essential to my mental well-being and, uh, and, and my being able to cope for those 50 very long weeks um, in Croatia. And this is the first time I've been able to publicly thank at least four members of that support group and who I'm glad to see are here today. Uh, Martin, Br please stand up. Martin Bright. <laughs> Anna Myers. Liz, Liz, Liz Gardner. Liz, please and Andy Pepper Parsons. You, you made, the, 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 these were a the core of four, there was other people as well from the European, European Center for Press Media Freedom and, and certain other lawyers who helped me along, but I cannot express my gratitude to you enough. But for you, I, I'd hate to think where I'd be today. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We'll be coming back to some of those issues in, in discussion. Um, if I could ask you, Gavin, to tell us some of your, share with us your experience of actually dealing with slaps and fending them off on behalf of clients. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. I've, I've actually been asked to sweep up a, a couple of other topics as well, which is well, I have notes, which is slightly feeble for a King's Council, but I just wanted to make sure by the time I finish, in my limited amount of time, I've covered everything uh, that I was asked to speak about. Um, I, w I will answer your question, but I, I think a little context about slaps is probably a good idea, because they're much talked about, but not always understood. Slaps are strategic litigation against public participation, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it was coined by two American academics in 1988. And I think in the current debate, it's probably time for a better description of them to come into being. The uh, slaps need to be rebranded so we can talk about them in, in mo modern language rather than old-fashioned American language. 
So if you have a piece of paper before you leave today and you have a great idea for rebranding slaps and what they should be called, do scribble it down, leave it, leave it on your seat, and they'll, they'll hoover it up and, and give them to me, and we'll, we'll try and ch change the dialogue. Um, they are s suits, pieces of litigation brought by large private interests or wealthy individuals to det deter citizens from exercising their political or legal rights or to punish them for doing so. Um, and generally, they're meritless, although the question of how meritless they have to be is a highly contentious one in terms of the availability of anti-slap remedies. Um, of course, it's not the suit often that's the problem. It's the threat or the series of threats from lawyers for the potential claim that precede the suit that are as important, because often that's what stops the uh, expression and intimidates the defendant, uh, potential defendant into silence for fear of the suit that may follow. Uh, and the lawyers who represent the claimants are very good at writing endless, um, long, threatening letters to the target of the potential slap uh, to try and see them off early on. The deterrence, obviously, in, 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 of the slap is being dragged into incredibly stressful, time-consuming and costly litigation. Um, uh, brought against you by somebody who can afford, has the time and the money to, to pursue it. So in the High Court of Defence, in a defamation case that goes to trial, will, will cost you something north of half a million pounds normally these days, even in the era of, of controlled costs and cost budgeting. Um, and of course, if you lose, you're exposed to the risk of a cost order on the other side doubling the amount you're liable for. Um, commonly, um, they are here claims in defamation, uh, which concern damage to reputation for allegations of misconduct. Um, so a company can say, we've been, we've been damaged by being accused of being um, of discreditable conduct in some form, or other corruption being the obvious example. But also misuse of private information, misuse of confidential information, data protection, breach of IP rights. And, and in other countries, as, as, as you, you've heard, from Jonathan, there are all kinds of other creative criminal and civil complaints that can be brought against somebody as part of a slap uh, tactic. Uh, whistleblowers are caught because the right that's an issue is invariably the right to uh, freedom of speech. Uh, that is specifically communicating information or allegations from one person to another or to the world at large or a section of the public in the public interest. Though we shouldn't forget that it can also be the right to protest. So it's not necessarily just the right to expression. They, they have been used often against uh, protesters in, in different contexts in this country. Um, uh, and the obvious ex examples are being an open source for, for a journalist who publishes your material. They can come after you. Or these days being a self-publisher on social media and, or standing up and, and saying publicly in some forum what your information and allegations are. Um, Anti-slap laws enable early dismissal of the claim uh, and uh, possible other remedies like cost capping and possible penalties. Um, uh, so they will, if they exist and they are effective, will deter the slapper from using the slap uh, tactic. It negates the whole tactic if you have this weapon in your armory as a potential defendant. Um, and as we all know recently, there have been developments both in the EU and, and here to, towards anti-slap legislation, which allows the potential defendant to, to, to get the court to stop the case um, early on. Um, the, the issues, and you see this in the European Directive that's just in play at the moment, are normally about, um, is the claim meritless or is it an abuse of process? Is it something the court would recognise as a misuse of the court's procedure? The, the central problem, it seems to me, in, 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 in the cases I, in, the, in, the, in the argument I've put about this in the public debate recently is that, is that those pigeonholes for identifying a slap and stopping it are A, too narrow, and B, too easy for potential claimants to get over. So it's very easy for a claimant to say, well, it's not an abuse of process. I'm genuinely distressed about this allegation that's being made against me, and I want my access to the court to defend my reputation. Um, and and my, my, my case has some merit, because by definition, what the whistleblower is doing is usually making a serious allegation of misconduct. 
and, and that is damaging per se to reputation. Therefore, bingo, you've got a defamation uh, claim. So my position is judges need a tool by way of an anti-slap law that is much more value judgment based, where the judge doesn't get dragged into these pigeonholes about formal categorization of the case and the mental state of the, of the claimant, but asks instead on, on a balancing exercise, what is the balance of social goods and social evils in this case? What, what are the adverse consequences for a democratic society if we allow the, a piece of litigation like this to go ahead? versus what is the downside for the claimant if it would just stop it at this case, right? So if you're Roman Abramovich, you've got millions of, billions of pounds, you've got endless PR spin doctors who can do your, try and restore your reputation. You don't need to come to court to, to, to do that. If you're a big company, you don't need to come to court to do that. The consequences on the other side could be absolutely disastrous in societal terms and for the individual concerned. And I think we need judges to be able to use that sort of balancing exercise to throw cases out. Um, I was asked, secondly and thirdly, to say a word about the, the employment tribunal provisions that can, 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 can apply in this situation, in particular, whether you can claim a detriment if you've been subjected to a slap, whether you can use those provisions if you're an employee. The answer, is, as you probably know, is that the, the, the PEDA provisions in the Employment Relations Act apply only to employees, only to very limited categories of, of disclosure. To, to get within the Act, there's always, there's always a what question and a who question. What is the content of your disclosure and who are you disclosing it to? So those are quite narrow categories. It's very difficult to run a PEDA claim if you're not disclosing internally to an employer. But even if you, you can get your case up and running on that, I mean, on, on that point, the, the tribunals and the courts have said, if you want to claim a detriment as a result of the whistleblowing, it has to be in the employment field. It has to be related to your position as an employee with that employer. So if some third party comes along, you, you happen to have libeled in the whistleblowing um, and damaged and sues you in, in libel, that's external to your employment relationship. It's nothing to do with the employment relationship, and, and it'll be almost impossible for you to claim that's a detriment uh, under PETA. Finally, I was asked to say a word about Josie Stewart's case. Um, uh, I don't know if you've, you've followed this, this case in the press. It's a, very, it's a very disturbing case. She was a civil servant who was working in the Afghan Crisis Centre in um, 2021, in the summer of 2021. Uh, and saw the failings of the crisis centre, which led to disastrous consequences in Kabul for many of the people that we owed obligations to who were supposed to be evacuated out of Kabul in that very short period. Um, uh, she, was, she went to the BBC in circumstances I'll mention at the moment. Uh, she was accidentally identified by the BBC. Uh, the government, the Foreign, foreign Office, pounced suspended her security clearance, which was necessary for her continued employment as a civil servant. And then on the basis that they suspended the security clearance, they sacked her and she lost, lost her career. So we're bringing a PETA, a PETA claim through the tribunal um, on her behalf, which is, uh, raises a number of interesting issues about the ability of civil servants to use PETA and to use the legislation in, in this sort of circumstance. In particular, given A, that she's subject to very strict confidentiality rules under the um, Civil Service Code, the Official Secrets Act, and her contract for employment, and has to have security clearance in, in the national interest, etc. Uh, and secondly, that she disclosed to a third party, that she went to a public interest journalist at the BBC on Newsnight to make her disclosures and put her account of what happened in the crisis centre in the public domain. There are many novel points in there, and it's an interesting case, and, and hopefully one day, if we ever get there, we'll, we'll test those in, in the litigation. But an issue has arisen which is being litigated collaterally at the moment, and we are waiting for a decision in the tribunal, which essentially goes like this. She has advanced as part of her case in her witness statement an account of why she went to the BBC and why she was, it was reasonable in all the circumstances for her to go externally to a public interest journalist to put her allegations into the public domain. And essentially her account is that uh, one very junior previous civil service whistleblower had given evidence to the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons um, 
which had been published on the House of Commons website. And on the day it was published, giving an absolutely devastating account of the failings of the Afghan Crisis Centre and the people that were let down as a result of its failings, <laughs> um, on, on, on the day it was published, this young civil servant was attacked publicly in the media by the Foreign, foreign Secretary and the government on the news round starting from today in the morning. He was literally trashed to somebody who didn't know what he was talking about. And she knew, he, she knew that this was something that needed corroborating in the public interest, that what he had told Parliament um, was something she agreed with as somebody who'd been working... She didn't know him. She'd just been working in another part of the crisis centre. And um, that core part of her case is now being challenged by the Foreign Office as contrary to parliamentary privilege. So it, it's being said you could not run a PEDA case as a civil servant where a key... You know, you can, but you, you have a half a case, where a key part of your case is I was motivated to whistleblow publicly because the, the government was misleading Parliament. And it is an odd proposition. You would have thought that's the one situation in which the Public Interest Disclosure Act would, would see sense in protecting your right to whistleblow. But at the moment, we're looking at a possible strike out of that part of her case, which will be devastating. So in each of those areas, Whatever the outcome of the litigation, we, we need some change in that law. We need some change in the substantive law of PETA, and we need change in terms of parliamentary privilege that protects misleading of Parliament um, from public interest disclosures. Thank you very much, Gavin. I'm sure we'll come back to people will have questions on, on those issues. Um, so I'd like to call upon Marion uh, to give us the journalist's perspective on SLAPs. You've had vast experience, Marion. Yeah, well, I'd like to start off with the Steve Coogan Savile drama that's coming out on Monday. Uh, journalists tried to expose Savile going right back to the 60s. Uh, we know that in the 90s, Sunday Mirror nearly did it. And they were persuaded that the legal threat of legal action uh, involving Sir George Carman would mean that their whistleblowers who'd come forward would be destroyed in court and that they would not be believed. We know again that in 2008, uh, the Sun tried to expose him. I've seen the legal papers. And again, the legal advice was he's too powerful. I know that when I was gathering information on him, just before he died, I couldn't have persuaded our lawyers uh, that the public interest would justify the fact that we would find ourselves in court against very serious legal action. Uh, and that whole threat over all those years, over those decades, meant that hundreds of women and girls were raped. Thousands were assaulted. And I think a legal system that allows that to happen, where powerful individuals or powerful corporations do that, cannot be allowed to continue. It really cannot. Uh, now, as editor of the Bureau, uh, we had probably about one legal threat a week over the time I was there. Uh, usually fairly ranting uh, lawyers' letters. Uh, you'll all be familiar with the, the usual suspects. Uh, in May last year, um, a company that was accused by the Kazakh government of uh, stealing billions from Kazakhstan uh, sued the Bureau, the Daily Telegraph, and Open Democracy. Uh, that case is still going. This company, it doesn't really matter whether they win or not. While that threat is there, nobody else is going to write anything about them. And this case has been going since May. It's only had one day in court, but the cost so far between the three defendants uh, and uh, the Kazakh-linked company are probably already over a million pounds. It sucks up huge amounts of time. You know, if you're an investigative journalist trying to work with whistleblowers, you're spending most of your time dealing with lawyers. Uh, fortunately, we're represented by Gavin, uh, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, but um, it's an immense burden on investigative journalists who really ought to be working with whistleblowers to get stories out. And we have to say to whistleblowers, uh, we have to turn away whistleblowers all the time. 
and say, these are the risks, these are the threats to you. This could happen to you, what happened to Jonathan, you know, if you come to us. Uh, and for myself, I'm very, very strong in giving that advice to them, saying, you really need to think this through. You nearly, really need to see what the consequences are. Now, sometimes, you know, I often say it's much easier to find something out if you already know it. Sometimes the fact that the whistleblower has come to you means that you know where to go, you know where to get documents, you know where to get other information, which means you can still run the story without involving the whistleblower. Uh, but it's a position that none of us should be in. Um, and I know, I know we're running out of time. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Marion. Thank you very much. Charlie. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'll try and be as quick as possible. There's a lot to cover uh, when it comes to the action that's been taken on a European UK level. I'll try to give some background and explain why we've been putting so much focus in coalition work. Uh, just briefly, the story really starts in, in the US. That's where I was working, uh, and we were um, in 2016 and 17 targeted by two aggressive lawsuits. Um, and I, we, we, we were struck then about the fact that while this was something that my organization, Greenpeace International, was able to respond to, uh, others were not in a position to do so. I remember being struck then about the fact that these lawsuits could cost millions of dollars a year and could stretch on for years. And yet the cost was so immaterial that it wouldn't even appear on the financial statement of the companies that were targeting us. Uh, we also recognized there that legal strategy, however robust it is, is, is never going to be sufficient to respond to the threat of slaps. And that's because, as has already been described here, slaps operate through the litigation process. The outcome is often beside the point. It's the process which drives up costs, which is used as a tool to harass and intimidate the target. And for the same reason, substantive legal protections are never going to be enough. This was happening in the country of the First Amendment, of free speech, uh, and it, that they, those protections are, are feeble in the face of uh, astronomically high legal fees and so on. So this was, I, I give the US as a context, as this was where in 2018 a coalition protect the protest was launched. Um, but this didn't happen in a vacuum. Gavin has already noted that it was in 1988 that the, the, the first research on SLAPS was published by George Pring and Penelope Canaan. It was a year after that that the first anti-SLAP law was published in the state of Washington, which I think underscores the importance of research here. Uh, and I think this was why there was such momentum in the US, but not so much in Europe. There was no comparable information in Europe, no comparable set of research which was able to fully catalogue the problem. So they were often, SAPs were often talked about in isolation as a result. So in 2019, we started working on research. But again, this wasn't in a, in a, in a vacuum. We already knew that there was a problem in Europe. And this was something that had, of course, been devastatingly underscored by the death of Daphne Karen Galizia. Uh, and the research that we worked on was ultimately published in 2019 by, uh, in, in collaboration with the Daphne Caron Eclizia Foundation. That, that research really then provided the foundation for the Coalition Against Slaps in Europe, uh, which was launched in 2019. I sit on the steering committee with Anna Myers, who's, who's here as well, uh, and that's been going on. Uh, and that brings me to, to the UK, because it was here too that that, that, that research was so important. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, we knew a slap for a problem in the UK. We knew about Jimmy Savile. We knew about Robert Maxwell. We knew about all of the rapacious legal firms, that law firms we know here, who, who, who make, have really made their business on the back of slaps. Um, but again, before we were able to catalogue and build that data, it, we weren't able to really highlight the problem. Uh, and that's why the person who should have been in this chair, and she's unfortunately suffering with uh, COVID is so important here, which is Susan Cotri, the director of Foreign Policy Centre, who published a report on, on SLAPS uh, in the UK. Uh, and really then, I think, first put that on the agenda. And then uh, in early 2019, Susan and Jessica Neem Maynan from Index on Censorship created the UK Anti-SLAP Coalition, uh, of which I joined as co-chair in March of, 20, of, of 2019, 2021. Sorry, I'm getting all of my dates mixed up. So to today, I'm just, I realize time is short, but I just wanted to very quickly get to uh, uh, where we've got to now. 
the progress. We've seen a lot of progress in the last few years. So in March 2021, the European Commission published its proposed directive. It was part of a package of measures. It also included a recommendation on SLAPs. Uh, and that, that directive is now uh, subject to trilogues between the three institutions of the European Union. Um, I can't say it, it's, it's not unambiguously good news in the direction it's heading in. The European Council's general approach has sought to, to drastically water down the provisions in that draft directive. And that's a, a, a re going to be really important how that turns out. In late 2021, both institutions of the Council of Europe uh, committed to taking action on SLAPs. A, an expert group was formed in the Council of, of Europe, uh, which is currently working on a draft recommendation on SLAPs. And then, of course, here in the UK, in July 2022, the Ministry of Justice committed itself to taking action uh, on SLAPs. Uh, and most recently, we've seen that action manifest itself in an amendment to the Economic Crimes and Transparency Bill. So I'll just end by looking uh, at the final question that I was asked, which was about the appetite for, for reform in the UK. Now, on the one hand, there's no doubt that the UK is, believe it or not, currently leading the way on anti-SLAP action, simply in terms of the fact that it is about to pass into law uh, it, the first explicit anti-SLAP measures in Europe, and that's good news. On the other hand, uh, on the basis of the Economic Crimes Bill, or Act, soon to be Act, uh, this is quite clearly inadequate, and there is no commitment yet for a standalone law. We have clear standards in the UK anti-SLAP coalition. We have a model law which covers all of the, the, the key standards that we, uh, or the key components of an effective anti-SLAP law. And I think the signs here are mixed. Gavin noted the importance of steering away from any type of subjective inquiry. Unfortunately, the Economic Crimes uh, Act will include lots of needless complexity and some of this uh, subjective inquiry into the mind of the filer. But there is a framework there that is promising and a lot to work on. So there is encouraging signs, uh, and I think there's a lot to play for here. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie, and in particular for stepping in at the last minute when Susan fell ill. We're very grateful to you. I, I wonder if I could ask you if you could just pick any one element of anti-SLAPS legislation. If, it, if the world was restricted in that way and you could only choose one, what would it be? I noted SLAPS operate through the litigation process. The longer that litigation process stretches on for, and often there are active attempts to stretch out this process, then the more damage is caused. The single most important component of any anti-SLAP law is the early dismissal mechanism. It's a mechanism to ensure that those, uh, those SLAPs are disposed of as quickly as possible and before uh, expenses can be, can, be, can be driven up. But I just say two things very briefly. The first thing is that, as Gavin has already said, that early dismissal mechanism can't rely on a subjective inquiry into the mind of the filer. It's too unreliable. So there needs to be a more objective test. And what that means in practice, in the most effective anti-slap laws, is a, is, a, is a higher threshold that the slap claimant has to meet in order to proceed to trial. If they don't meet that threshold test, then that case is dismissed before it goes to trial. And that's really what we've been fighting for in, in many of these cases. Thank you very much. Jonathan, would you, what would you feeling be if you could pick <coughs> one thing that would really have helped you through the trials and terrible things that happened in your case? I'm not having to be reliant upon civil society to get the treatment I did. I mean, I got the, the kitchen sink plus uh, thrown at me. Um, often people wonder, well, bribes are paid. It used to be tax exempt in, in Switzerland a few years ago. You know, who suffered? Well, actually, predominantly money was um, paid to, to kleptocrats. Um, where that money should have been spent on infrastructure, schools, hospitals, roads, that sort of thing, keeping people below the poverty line in places like Angola, Equatorial Guinea. Furthermore, this neo-colonisation, as I've heard it called, the payment of bribes, also undermined democracy in the fourth largest democracy in the world, in Brazil. SBM were paying the Workers' Party um, at, at its request. Um, in order to obviously get its dirty deeds done and its contracts won. Um, you cannot overstate um, the effects of paying bribes in modern society and the perils and the evils um, that, that, it, that it leads to.
to. I'm conscious that time is really pressing in, so I wonder if we could open it up for questions. I see a gentleman over there. Uh, yes, uh, well, thanks, Jonathan, for your um, kind words earlier. Uh, I wonder if we could just um, talk briefly about the role of the media <laughs> and the role of newspapers in particular in this. Um, something shifted uh, in my time working uh, at the Observer and the New Statesman in particular. Uh, there was a time when I first started in newspapers when it was seen as a badge of honour in certain circumstances to receive a libel writ uh, because it showed you were doing your job. Not in all cases, but you know, largely that was that was seen as a as a badge of honour. That really changed when certain companies, certain legal legal firms, got tougher. And what they did is they started showing that they could represent criminals and wrongdoers. That they it used to be the case that you would think, well, if someone doesn't have a reputation to defend, then it's fine to write about them. But certain legal companies then realized that actually they could defend people without a reputation, that they could defend criminals. And what then happened is when the financial model of newspapers started to collapse, newspapers became weak, particularly local newspapers, and they stopped not defending libel actions. Uh, and that puts everybody in civil society and in journalism in an extremely vulnerable situation. Uh, because journalists are not protected, the public's not protected, uh, because newspapers do not fight those cases. Is there something that we can do to force media organisations to do their job by fighting these cases in order to protect civil society and, uh, well, and the journalists that are working for them? Marion, could you take that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the simple thing is change the law. You know, as I said about the Savile thing, when a law is so unbalanced that it protects you know multiple offenders you know huge predators and likewise does the same for terrible terrible companies which you know very often don't exist in any real sense they're just there as a way of laundering money and taking money um, we actually need to change the law